Hey, what's up guys, Sir Amanon here, and welcome to another episode of Cheap Competitive Contenders, the series where I try and take a budget deck list of around $100 and then try and face off against the metagame. So normally it's under 100 and this time I had to go a little bit above because I'm going to admit guys, this was a really tough episode to try and put together a deck list for. Uh, you guys can see, obviously, uh, Curse Eldwind got bought out <laughs> pretty much right after I put up the poll, which I'll throw up on screen for you guys right now. But uh, yeah, I had to do the best with what I got, which is why you can see you know, some interesting decisions as far as the cards that I am including, as well as some cards that didn't make the cut. Um, you know, for example, cards like Black Awakening, still like over 20 bucks, and then like the third Golden Lore didn't make the list either. Uh, so obviously we had to shave some corners somewhere in order to make the list fit. But I do think that still we have a decently competitive list here. I will say that this is probably on the worst end in terms of competitive viability of the episodes I've done so far. But regardless, you still can definitely make it work and have some replays showing off, obviously against the metagame, uh, so you guys can see exactly where the strengths and weaknesses lie. But I'll throw up for you guys on screen as well right now the price breakdown. So you have a more clear picture of what I'm kind of talking about here. And you can see the main deck by itself was just under that $100 threshold. So I figured that that's good enough for the most part. And you can see the extra in the side are really just kind of thrown together. Um, and it's kind of fascinating to think about how you can fit like 30 cards in the extra inside in like about, it was like 8 or $9 I feel, if I remember correctly. So yeah, that is pretty fascinating to think about. But yeah, this is pretty cut and dry as far as just like what a pure Eldritch list looks like. Uh, thankfully that won the poll rather than a Zoo Eldritch because, oh boy, I would not have been able to fit Zoo cards into this list for sure. But yeah, as, as per usual, if you guys do want to purchase any of these cards, definitely check out the link to my TCG player affiliate link down in the description box below as per usual. It really does go a long way to help support the channel. And if you like this series or just general long form content on my channel, definitely consider subscribing and supporting me via Patreon. I'll have that link in the description box as well. Uh, this takes quite a while to produce, so I would definitely appreciate your support in that regard. But without further ado, let's just go ahead and run through the list here. Uh, so basically the entire concept of this is that it's essentially just pure Eldritch with like a very small Light Swarm package. So the premise behind the uh, Light Swarm package here is just to try and mill Eldritch cards to the graveyard, that way you can play a little bit faster. Um, because you could opt to play things like Inspector Border, which I do have cited here for like the matchup post side. Um, but I figured that you want to try and, for one, have a game plan going first or going second. These cards are just generally a little bit better going second. But also, I feel like this synergizes overall with the Eldritch cards a lot more. Um, this was played in early kind of preliminary builds pre-Synchro Eldritch. And I figured that reverting back to this on a budget would be a decent idea, considering the fact that we can't play, you know, Pot of Extravagance, for example. Um, and actually, the funny thing here is that uh, we weren't able to, or able even to afford the uh, zombie cards because Baylor drops a couple of bucks and uh, things like Necro or Banshee as well like kind of bumped the price up to even more than what this already was going to be. Like the Eldritch engine itself was around 80 to 85 dollars so trying to fill in the gaps is pretty difficult so I feel like the Light Sword engine was the best bang for its buck but obviously if you can afford to play other things definitely go for it. I also considered playing a spellbook package, and you'll see in some of the games that I was testing it. Um, I was playing like a Blue Boy, Two Secrets, and Knowledge, which was fine, but I also didn't want to bulk up on too many normal summons. And truth be told, I really just wanted to fit the main deck, if any, if nothing else, to be under $100. And as you can see, I barely was able to you know, fit everything in. So changes had to be made, but I feel like this is a healthy number, or amount of starters. Rather, You have seven for the Light Swords. You have three more in uh, Curse Eldland, and then I guess Scarlet is technically a starter, even though it's a bit slow. But yeah, I figured that the Light Swarm package helps facilitate the Eldritch cards pretty well. That's why we are playing it. And then we're going to or go to the uh, Eldritch cards, which of course got three Curse Eldland. This card got bought out, feels bad. But, you know, this card is one of the best playmakers you can have access to, which is obviously very good. Uh, two Eldritch to the Golden Lord, you actually don't even really need three. Um, because like this card is not amazing to draw going first and you want to go first. Uh, it helps big boards going second, but I mean playing basically one less copy because like this is another copy of Eldritch effectively, um, going second is not too detrimental. Um, he really just doesn't do a whole ton in your hand a lot of the time, uh, and it's better to just draw the other cards in most cases. So two is actually not that bad, even if like you have the room to play three, you have the budget to play three. 
Then we have a uh, three Scarlet, of course, and we have the White Destiny. I would play Black Awakening, but that card is over twenty bucks, and I figure that if there's any card that we can afford to shave, it would be that one. Uh, it's not one that I wanted to, but kind of have to. I also thought about playing two of this just to be able to mill more off the Light Swords, but it really sucks to open this card when you don't have your Light or sorry your Eldritch package going yet. And then we have three Conquistador, and then the Golden Land Forever. Uh, I played this card in the main deck just because it's a more pure Eldritch build, so uh, you can get access to it a lot more readily. And then we also have uh, three Alcaro, and then one Guardian. This is another name, but also an Outs Dragoon, which this deck really just has a tough time dealing with, um, especially because we can't play uh, Super Dreadnought, uh, the Libe, the big train guy, because that card's also expensive. So your Outs are pretty limited, so this is one of the more reliable ways to do it. Then we have some uh, defensive cards that are non-engine. We have three Book of Moon, three Torrential, and three Strike. These are all cards that are good going first or going second. Um, Strike generally needs other cards to make it work better, but I mean, you have so many of these cards. Uh, and you have like Floodgates, like Gozen Rivalry, that kind of act like pseudo Torrentials against established boards, um, as long as, you know, they're not mono type or mono attribute decks. Um, so you can combo any of these together and it would be decent at breaking the board. It's not spectacular. And we're not playing hand traps because you know there's not really a whole like a lot of a point in playing just like a couple of hand traps in this list. So I figured just going all in on the really powerful and impactful back row uh, would be the way to go. And you know these are some of the best cards in the format right now. Like book, torrential, and strike are all same play just in general. Like even outside of a budget context. So I think that's a pretty uh, good fallback to have access to. And then we have the floodgates, of course, and the imperial order just as another sort of uh, win button against certain matchups. The extra deck can honestly be what you want it to be as long as you play. I recommend playing Imduck and or Link Spider um, just to be able to get rid of your Golden Lands. I'd recommend playing uh, Pleiades. I'd recommend playing the Trains. If you have access to Libe, definitely play it. Um, but other than that, this is very, very flexible. You can play like Vampire Sucker. Uh, you could play um, a whole host of other things. I play Paradise Smashers because it's funny. Um, but realistically, you know, these cards are all really cheap, which is why uh, they're in here. And then I'll just go over through them, I guess, if you want to have the card names read out. So Vermilion Dragon Mech, we have Sky Place, Gengari Dai, we have Super Dreadnought Real Cannon, Gustav Max, uh, Full Armor Crystal Zero Lancer, Tyrus Keeper of Genesis, uh, Valiant Lancer Shark. Uh, oh yeah, I should explain the uh, Crystal Zero as well. Um, this is also kind of an Outer Dragoon. If you can get to a rank 5, you can just uh, make this and then make this on top of it, and it becomes 37, so you can just attack over Dragoon. It's not a great out, but it's at least an out, so that's why we have that. Uh, this also is a monster pop, which is pretty decent. Uh, two Quinsari Pleiades, one Shark Fortress, one number seven Paradise Smasher. This card's actually kind of funny. It's like a one turn Mystic Mine if you get to go your way, which you oftentimes can. Uh, it's not horrible, surprisingly. Uh, and then we got Akashic Magician, Barricade Blocker, a Gravity Controller if you want to you know, just link stuff away and have non-targeting outs. And then we got Imduck as well. And then the side deck is Pancratops, Generico second card, Lila, which is cool with the Lightsworn package, good against back row. Uh, three, uh, Inspector Border for going first uh, against like combo decks if you want to have it in. Uh, three, Eater of Millions. You could also just play Kaijus over this. Uh, probably would be better, but Eater is kind of funny. Uh, plus it's cheaper. I mean, the side deck really is just a throwaway due to the budget. Um, but yeah, you don't care about your extra deck, so like you could honestly play this if you wanted to. But Kaijus are probably better, realistically. Uh, one copy of Regeki, three Dark Hole for board wipes. This is decent against like Zoo and stuff. And then three MST. I could play Cosmic, but again, we are really just trying to spend as little as possible on the side and the extra, given how expensive the main deck is. But with that being said, let's go ahead and just hop into the gameplay. Alright, so match number one here is going to be up against Zodiac, and this is a pretty grindy back and forth matchup, which is nice for Eldritch. Uh, the thing is, however, is that, you know, Zoo just tends to get their engine started a lot more quickly, especially compared to like this build, but uh, we're going to just see how things play out. So our opponent is going first, uh, they're going to start off with the normal summon copy of Whiptail, going for a Dryden and then setting the Cosmic and Passing. Our hand is pretty decent until we draw the Spellbook of Knowledge. You can see the uh, experimental Spellbook engine and one of the downsides of it is drawing this card by itself is really, really bad. If Raiden was a Spellcaster, that'd be crazy. But we're going to charge here. We don't hit anything good off of it, unfortunately, but we have Raiden as a chance to try and do it again. But our opponent is going to proactively hit our Raiden, which is reasonable given the fact that there's actually nothing in our hand that is going to amount to a whole lot. Uh, they can reasonably assume we're on like a trap, like Eldritch deck, just because we milled three traps off the charge. Um, so like what other deck is really going to play Light Swords, right? Uh, we are going to go for the Cursed Eldon next, but that is going to get met with a Cosmic Cyclone, so no search for us. And we are kind of, you know, 
We're not dead for sure because it's Zoo, but we're in a tough spot. We do get to Torrential when they go for another copy of Borbo here, but that leads the way for Avarice to be used, and they're going to be able to draw a couple of cards in the process. But they don't find anything in terms of extension, however they are, are able to Ash our copy of Scarlet. So we're going to have to play the waiting game a little bit longer. We pick up our Wakero and then we're going to set a copy of Conquistador off of this Scarlet here and then just pass our turn back. They draw the third copy of Ash, which thankfully for us is buying us some time, but we really do need to find a way out of the game pretty quickly. We are going to go down for 1800 damage and then go for Index so we can try and get a Scarlet. We already had one drawn for turn, so that wasn't an ideal draw, but we want to accelerate the pace of the game as much as we can. Our opponent is going to draw a Tenki. I try and just go ahead and get Eldritch so we can pop the Zoo on Summon, but we get Ash again, which is going to be unfortunate. They also have the Alpha, which is finally alive, and are able to summon the Wrap here. Here they're going to go for a Mega Clops, but we don't have any way to meaningfully interact. Uh, and Gozen is really terrible in this matchup, as you can see, like the Alpha and the Zoos and everything are all Earth. So this is a card that is an insta side out. So we're going to go ahead and watch our opponent go for the Mega Clops, so we can't really say or do anything about it. So our hands are pretty tied here. Uh, and we're going to have to struggle to out this card because we really need just a couple of golden lands to be able to even make an Xyz. Here I make the mistake of summoning Conquistador to try and block, but our opponent decides to actually not replay so they can absorb the Conquistador with the Mega Clops effect, putting it under Dryden. So a bit of a misplay for me there. But we are going to hopefully try and pick up something. We do pick up a copy of Spellbook of Secrets, which is pretty decent, um, but that does get ashed. Uh, it didn't matter if we used Knowledge or Secrets there, we were getting Ash regardless. But thankfully that means that our Scarlet does resolve. That is the final copy of Ash from their deck. So we are going to go ahead and try and attack into this Dryden, but that is of course going to get popped. Uh, we thankfully do have at least Eldritch and Grave now to be able to use this um, Knowledge for something. Which you know makes it not completely dead on arrival, but we are really quickly running out of resources. And we are on a not ideal rotation of Eldrixers versus Golden Lands, because we have no interruption on our opponent's turn basically. So opponent is going to attach the White Destiny and is going to actually misplay. So they go for a Tiger Mortar, or sorry, Alpha to try and bounce the Tiger Mortar to bounce the Golden Lord, but it has to return specifically to hand. So that's why it just goes to the extra deck and nothing happens. But really, we're just out of this game regardless. They can just attack over with um, Mega Cops anyway. They're going to pick one of their Zoo and just go for Tiger Mortar and just uh, actually Whip Tail Banish it, uh, willing to take the damage there to get the resource out of Grave, which is very smart. So we're even in more of trouble here. This can't attack directly because of its effect, and we can't really deal with Zeus either. We could have Goza Match to prevent that, but realistically we're just out of the game anyways. Uh, we pick up the Blue Boy, which is the last part of the engine, and we scoop that game. So not an amazing game one, but we can try again here in game number two because we are going first. And so we're able to actually set up pretty well. Now I do want to play around Lightning Storm here or Happy Starter Duster, simply because this particular build as you can tell, it plays a lot of back row, and really there's just no space for hand traps or enough hand traps to actually make a difference versus combo decks. So we're all in on the back row, and we want to make sure that we're playing with our actual proactive cards. I'm keeping Book of Moon in hand specifically because against Trident or Zeus, you can just use it on your own turn and just uh, not really care about it too much. And you don't really need both it and Tarantula to stop your opponent's Zoo plays, so I figured that just having one or the other was fine and both were unnecessary. And that was actually the right play because my opponent does have a copy of Lightning Storm. We do chain the Scarlet to try and get Eldritch into rotation. But our board does get wiped and unfortunately we do get punished by the Alpha which is now alive as a result of that. So if I was going to go and just walk over a board and attack with Borbo before going into Zeus. Then we're going to try and recover a little bit with the Conquistador that was blown up by the Lightning Storm. My opponent could have actually used the Zeus right there because I already used Scarlet on field effect, so neither of these in Grave can trigger in the end phase. But I think my opponent wanted to get a little more value out of it, especially because Zeus, or sorry, um, Alpha was still on board, which makes a lot of sense. So we're going to Book a Moon, like I said. We can just use it to kind of force it early at an inopportune time, which is good news for us because we're able to follow up with a copy of Curse Eldland. That can add a copy of Golden Land forever because we can actually get quite a lot of value this turn. We're able to send the Curse Eldon with the uh, Golden Lord to be able to summon itself as well as sending a Guardian to the graveyard. This way we're able to get more Eldritch spells into rotation. We use these Scarlets to grab a copy of Conquistador. We set our Golden Land forever and our White Destiny. And we go ahead and go for our Scarlet. I figure at this point, you know, all the chips are down. We got to just try and set everything. Even if they have the Lightning Storm, they have it at this point. Plus we do have the Golden Land forever to negate it if needed. Now, our opponent draws a copy of Tenki, so there's a lot of Zoo cards in hand. I don't go ahead and use this Conquistador yet because I want to make sure that I preserve it for the normal summon because if I pop Tenki and they normal summon a Zoo, then that's a really, really big waste. So we just go ahead and go for the Conquistador. We pop the Chakanine, but 
Unfortunately, my opponent has the Avarice. Now, I choose not to use the Golden Land Forever here, thinking that, okay, there's not really a whole ton of things that can be drawn besides Extenders, and I would want to stop the Extenders themselves. And also, I just want to make sure that I don't, you know, get blown up by, like, maybe a bait into Harpy's Feather Duster. Would rather just kind of wait. My opponent still had two cards in hand, and actually those two cards were both the Extenders anyways. So, uh, we did find in terms of, you know, just stopping it for what would be the more impactful card immediately because cards that were drawn off the Avis were not going to be immediately helpful to my opponent. But even though we get to negate the Barrage, they still have the Monster Reborn. So there's going to be a Zoo play regardless here. Uh, we get smacked for 500 with Borbo. And then my opponent can just freely play, not have to worry about Nibiru because we don't have any cards in hand, and then make a 4 mat Zeus and Wiper board. Thankfully, we do actually have quite a bit of recovery left still. So the cool thing with Eldritch against Zeus specifically is that we can use it in Graveyard to actually just force it at any time. So because it can just beat over it, we can just uh, make sure that Zeus doesn't actually hit our back row, which is really good. So we can go ahead and use our White Destiny to set a copy of Hawk Hero, and then we also have a copy of Conquistador set additionally. Now, we don't have any Eldritch cards, so these Golden Land spells aren't live, but we do have Torrential. My opponent does have a copy of Avarice, which draws another Zoo, but thankfully that allows us to use Torrential, which is pretty nice. Now they're just going to set Imperm and have a couple of hand traps that don't really do a whole ton against us. We draw another copy of Dead Knowledge, like last game, but we are able to use it similarly to just get Eldritch onto the board, which is nice to leave both interruptions up. And they have a Desires as well, so double Avarice and Desires, they drew a lot of cards this game. But thankfully they only find Zoos and not enough Extenders to actually play past that because they already committed both Barrage and Reborn. So even though our uh, charge gets ashed here, we do mill a Golden Lord, so we can just go ahead and summon it and get in for game. So here we are in game 3, and our opponent is going to be able to go first. So we don't have too many amazing dedicated blind second cards, but we do have some options here. Uh, you'll notice that we have Cosmics here instead of uh, MSTs. Obviously, you can just play whichever one that you have, and I imagine most people have Cosmics, but for the sake of trying to spend as little as humanly possible on the side deck, I went with MSTs in the end, but it's largely not going to make a difference aside from like maybe Eldritch Mirrors. But we're going to go ahead and start off this game here. Our opponent is going to summon a Ram Ram, just go straight for Dryden. Nothing too particularly interesting there. Uh, there are hand traps in this hand that aren't going to be super great against us besides the Ash, which is going to be used on the Cursed Eldon here. And that is unfortunate because we don't have any disruption for our sort of Eldritch package, so we're going to have to wait for a little bit. So I don't have to commit to the Lightning Storm here either, because these back rows, besides hitting like tanky or Barrage, can be just used during my turn to stop actual defensive cards. So Fono is going for the sort of Ram Ram uh, into the Mega Clops play, and we just go ahead and Torrential at the opportune moment. But, of course, opponent does have the Avarice, so they're able to draw into a couple more cards. And one of them is a Feather Duster. Now, this is actually totally fine for us, because both of these cards float. Uh, specifically, the Cursed Eldolin, which is really good. And we're able to just get a copy of Eldritch Chair board, no problem. Our opponent does get another copy of a Zoo, but it's really not going to be that impactful here. Again, if we had the Cosmic there, it would have been nice, but it would have been blown away by the Feather Duster anyways. So, uh, saving it was totally okay. We go ahead and just get in for some damage and set it up for next turn. Our opponent is going to go for a Thoroughblade, and they do actually rip a Cosmic off of that Thoroughblade, which um, deals with our Conquistador quite nicely, which is very unfortunate, because we don't have a great way now to deal with this Zeus. So we do have to let our board go, but I'm still not feeling too badly about this, because again, we have Eldritch in circulation, so as long as we were able to just send it away and force the Zeus, we're in a fine spot. Now, I could have used Curse Eldon here first, but I just wanted to make sure that I would at least get the searches off. Um, because I want more value here. Since I already have a Scarlet in hand, didn't really feel the need to kind of, you know, utilize it to try and get max value. Figured that was a decent enough play. Opponent gets a copy of Book of Moon, which, you know, I'm totally okay with taking the damage just from Zeus. We're gonna go ahead and go for a Walkera. I thought there was a Dryden Engrave, but it was actually Shuffle Back via the Pot of Avarice. So a bit of a misplay on my part. But we do get to Cosmic the End Phase Book of Moon. And we're gonna just go ahead, pick up a Charge of the Light Brigade, get in for... A lot of damage, and this is actually the end of the match here. So before we hop into game number two here, or match number two here, which is going to be up against Dogmatica Invoked, uh, I do want to apologize because some of my opponents this week on Edo Pro left during the middle of the match, not like mid-game or anything, but between games two and three specifically. This actually happened twice, but even though that did happen, I want to highlight these games anyways because they were actually pretty good showcases of this build of Eldritch's strengths and weaknesses, so I thought they were still worth showing off. But in case you guys were wondering why, like now, like the matches weren't completed, that is why. 
So we're going to go ahead and get started here, again up against Dogmatica and Vote. We are going first and we have multiple Radiants, which is decent even though it is, you know, once per turn, obviously. Um, but we want to see a play starter, which is good. We have the White Destiny in main phase 1, which sets us a Conquistador. So we get to set that as well as the Guacero and the Rivalry. Then in the end phase, we hit a Guardian, which allows us to set us a copy of Scarlet. So that turns on two of our back row online, which is really good. Our opponent rips a copy in a Deer Servant, which is really, really strong. They can send an Entis, and that actually gets rid of what they know is the Conquistador, so they don't have to deal with that. And then they get an Ecclesia, which will search a copy of Maximus. Now, here I miss a window. Uh, I could have walked Harrow to the Entis out of the graveyard so that this Maximus couldn't be summoned. But again, I did not get the chance to because sometimes you forget to hold A, things like that happen. But not a big deal because our extra deck doesn't really matter too much. All that really matters is that they got to send another Entis and an Omega, which does hit our copy of Rivalry. But in this case, it didn't really matter because our opponent did commit to the normal summon with the Ecclesia. So we were never actually going to be able to use it this turn anyways. Our opponent's going to go ahead and use the Omega to recycle. And then we get to use the uh, Scarlet during the end phase, as well as the Conquistador that was popped to set another Scarlet. So we're in decent shape, and the cool thing is that, you know, my opponent's not really ever going to be able to summon, like, a Fleur-de-Lis, because we're not going to go into extra deck that much. So I figured that it's going to be a pretty easy way, actually, to try and get over opponent's board, especially with the, with the uh, top deck to curse Eldon here. So we can use that. We can search for another copy of Lord. That gets Walkera to Grave to uh, try and force the punishment. We do let it go, because it's not super incon or super consequential. We can send away the curse to summon itself. And then we can use the Walkera to actually hit the Titanic Cloud out of my opponent's graveyard so they can't use it. So that's very strong as well. Then we actually go into Vermilion Dragon Mech, which is really cool. Uh, even though it does turn on like the theoretical Florida Lease in their opponent's hand, I do just want to get rid of as many of these cards as I can, specifically the back row. So I try and hit it. It is unfortunately a droplet, which they use to send both the Ecclesia and the Gamma away. So that, you know, their Maximus is going to be alive still. Now, even though we can't clear the Maximus this turn, it's not that big of a deal. Because, again, our extra deck doesn't matter a whole ton. And all we have to really do with it is respond to what my opponent is going to be sending off of the Maximus. So they send an Apcolone. So I know that the set is likely going to be Schism. So what I do here is actually make an Adaptation. And I go ahead and just set a copy of Golden Land Forever. Uh, I guess I could have gone ahead and just set Conquistador so I could pop the Schism in response. But I really just wanted to make sure that you know, there was no real way that my opponent could actually proactively utilize it or like you know chain it in response to anything that I was doing. So basically, I was going to be always ahead in tempo in that sense. We pick up another copy of Curse Eldon, which is really good. We get to utilize the Golden Lord. I go ahead and negate the Golden Land forever because Construct can send a copy of Golden Lord, which would be over the Maximus, and that would be a little bit annoying. So we just go ahead and set our Conquistador and our Wakero, and I'm feeling pretty good about this one. My opponent draws a Florida Lease, and that is the end of the game. So here we are in game number two, and our opponent is going to be able to go first this time around, and they drew very, very well, whereas we did not. So going to have to be pretty lucky in order to win this one, to be honest. Our opponent's going to start off with a copy of Alistair, which is going to search for a copy of Invocation, unsurprisingly. Just going to go for the Security Gardener into the uh, copy of Makaba. Very unsurprising. They're just going to go ahead and recycle the Alistair, then activate Nadir's Servant. That's going to send a copy to Tanaclad so they can get the Ecclesia to hand. They don't actually go for a Maximus this time around, which I thought was pretty interesting. Instead, they just go ahead and set Punishment to search a copy of Ecclesia again, uh, instead of going for Floyd Elise. I thought there was going to be a Floyd Elise in hand, but guess not. We actually do go ahead and charge for a copy of Elila here, which is cool. And we get a pretty sick mill off of the Charge of the Light Brigade as well. So we go ahead and force out the Punishment, which I saw was searched. And we go ahead and use the Book of Moon in response. Here I'm just actually trying to bait up Makaba, but my opponent doesn't even respond to it. So the way this works is that my opponent can't check with Dogmatica Punishment to look at the attack value, so they don't get to send anything. And they don't get to pop it either. So we're able to go ahead and actually just get a bunch of value here. We don't even have to use the Walk Arrow since we already have uh, Scarlet set up. So we just go ahead and reserve that for later turns. Now opponent does get a copy of Harpy's Feather Duster down. And we do go ahead and have a very, very nice chain link here. So I chain Conquistador and then Scarlet, which I thought maybe would, you know, force Ash or something. But my opponent actually uses the Macabre. So I'm actually able to use Solemn Strike to negate it and then destroy the Ecclesia instead. So that's really, really good here. Now, the rest of our board does get wiped. But again, we're playing Eldritch, so we're not feeling horrible about it. Uh, opponent does go for Maximus this turn. 
and decided to just try and pop some of our board, which um, is going to be unfortunate because it's going to take a while to actually recover. And worse was that the Omega actually recycled the Golden Lord back to the deck, which is a big deal because that's the way that we we're going to try and kind of beat over the Maximus and you know stop my opponent from pushing. Because we had a one-turn reprieve where my opponent couldn't go for any Alistair stuff because they were under punishment. Uh, since even though it didn't pop anything, it's still resolved. But we are able to use a walk carrier that we saved from last turn to go for a Scarlet, and drawing the Golden Lord was not what we wanted to see. I decided not to activate the Scarlet this turn because it wasn't really going to accomplish anything, and instead I decided to use the Scarlet Engrave for a Conquistador so I could actually have Disruption. But at this point, because my opponent has Alistair still, it was probably going to be the end of the game. My opponent's going to go ahead and just grab Invocation. We can't really do a whole ton. I go ahead and try and pop the Augites and Summon, but my opponent does have the Ash for the Scarlet, so we are unable to really do anything. And this actually does trigger the Augites, just go ahead and pop the Conquistador right away. And my opponent draws a Nadir Servant and an Ecclesia and has the Augites, so there's able to clean up the board here and win this game. Now, like I mentioned, my opponent just left in game number three for some reason, so that's going to be the end of this match, but it was a still pretty good showcase of both the strengths and weaknesses of this deck. So match number three here is going to be up against Dragon Link, and this is a pretty interesting matchup because even though we're not affected by the uh, Dragon Buster Destruction Sword lock, it is going to be hard to sort of stand up to the pressure that our opponent can amount to if we're going second, unless we draw specific combinations of board wipes plus negation. But we are going first here, so that is pretty fortunate for us. Now we do actually get to play around with the Spellbook engine that I was talking about that I did ultimately end up cutting, but you can see the theory behind it here, right? We just go ahead and try and draw into more traps, and we pick up a Torrential and a Revival Reese. So even though our Eldritch engine is pretty slow, we are able to actually at least, you know, definitely survive for a turn. Now I go ahead and just try and hold my resources as much as possible here. Uh, my opponent has a Black Metal Dragon to start off with, and I decided to just keep waiting until my opponent has committed substantially to the board. Uh, so I let them go for the whole Divine Lance play into Link Cross, and then I have a decision to make, right? So I can either go for like a Floodgate, or I can commit the Torrential. I decided to actually just go for Torrential because I want my opponents to have as few resources as possible and then the Floodgate can hopefully just uh, choke them out of the game. Now this does unfortunately trigger the Brotar which grabs Levy which I do have to Solemn Strike otherwise we do just lose. Um, but our opponent does actually have the capability of following up here into a Fiber play which is totally fine because we are able to actually just flip up one of these Floodgates and that cripples our opponent's ability to actually go into Guard Dragon plays. So I just have to go for Seal and Pass. We end phase, use Scarlet, and we are in a pretty nice position here. I just go ahead and go straight to the battle phase to try and force it out. Uh, they're going to go ahead and bounce their own Brute Sector to protect it from uh, potential like Conquistadors or things like that. And we go ahead and beat over the Safer that's brought out. And we can go and grab a Conquistador, and we have a second copy of Strike and a Huacaro, so I'm feeling pretty good about this one. We can walk here with the Levianu when he tries to add it back off of the um, the safe right there. And then we can Conquistador, the Brute Sector launch. My opponent does have the Wyvern Burster, but we are able to actually flip up Gozen because then they can't go into Striker Dragon and they concede. So here we are in game two, and my opponent has full combo, whereas we have no hand traps. So let's see how far we can get. Our opponent is going to start off with a copy of Quick Launch, unsurprisingly, and go for a copy of Rocket Tracer. The Link Summon a copy of Striker Dragon, but they already have the Brute Sector in hand. So they're just going to use a second copy of Quick Launch to go for a Romulus. From here they're going to grab a Divine Lance and equip it to go ahead and grab a copy of the Phalanx from deck. They can use Phalanx to unequip itself and then go into Link Cross which will summon out a couple of tokens to their field. And to quote Mr. MBT Yu-Gi-Oh, stop me if you've seen this play before. We're going to go ahead and see a Martial Metal Marcher go into a copy of Phalanx before making a copy of Herald of the Arclight. And then they're going to go for Fiber to summon up Rocket Synchron before activating a copy of World Legacy Guard Dragon to bring back the Tracer, go into LP, go into Striker, and then use LP effect. Now they don't get Brotar for Levian here because they want both of these cards to actually, you know, combo off and make Savage correctly. So they go for Black Metal instead. They go for Pisty to bring back Tracer and then go for the Seratic Seal before banishing a monster to go for Red MD and bring back a uh, Phalanx to go for the Union Carrier. And then use the Brute Sector to summon out the Recharger out of hand to go and make Savage this way and then they go for Carrier with the Buster Lock. So we have to try and go ahead and deal with this, but we're not in a bad spot here. We just go ahead and set four. I don't want to risk potentially banishing Eldritches off the charge because of Herald, so I just go ahead and hold it. My opponent bounces back the World Legacy Guard Dragon with the Seal, which brings that Brotar, which is a pretty good play. From here, my opponent uses the World Legacy Guard Dragon to target the Brotar. We chain Wakero, then we chain Conquistador, then we chain Scarlet. Our opponent's going to chain Savage to negate the Scarlet, but we have a Solemn Strike set. 
So here the chain is going to resolve. We get to actually go ahead and summon out a Golden Lord, which allows both the Conquistador and the Wakira to fire. So we can not only pop the Striker Dragon to prevent any recharger loops, but we also get to use Wakira to hit the target out of the graveyard, which was Brotar. From here, opponent is going to recover with a Boot Sector to try and go for a Tracer, but without anything meaningful to go into, with just Borosword left in the extra deck, they actually just concede. So this is going to be the final match of the video, and I do apologize again, this is another one of those matches that just didn't go to a game 3 because my opponent left before it got to that point, but I can still showcase the other two games which are pretty interesting back and forth gameplay here. So we're up against Buster Blader Dogmatica as you can see. So pretty tough matchup because of the fact that we have very few outs to Dragoon as you'll see in this game 1 here. So we actually draw all three copies of Raiden, and I don't want to use this Rota because I want my Charge of the Light Brigade to still be alive, so I don't even use it. I just go ahead and go for Raiden, which mills two, and we do hit a copy of Wakero. Sucks to hit the Golden Land forever, but not a big deal. We can go ahead and use Wakero during the end phase to grab a copy of Scarlet, which doesn't turn out anything, but at least gets our Eldritch Engine online. My opponent draws a copy of Quick Launch, but doesn't even use that or the Buster Well. They just go for Dragoon straight up, and I just don't have a great out to this. What I should have done was probably just chain the Scarlet to the Red Ice Fusion, uh, even though it would have taken a lot more damage and would have gone down to 800. But I wanted to just see if my opponent would kind of use the Dragoon on the Scarlet so I can flip up rivalry. Because once I saw that they were on the Buster Raider stuff, I'm like, okay, as long as I can keep them off of the Dragon stuff, I should be in a decent spot. But I realized I can't out Dragoon, and we're just going to go to game 2. So that was kind of embarrassing that we just straight up lost to Dragoon there. Hopefully we can have a bit of a better showing in game 2. You can see the kind of meme eater of millions. This is definitely the worst card in the side deck. Uh, it's not a bad card just inherently, but you'd rather have kaijus, because anything that this is trying to out, you can just out with a kaiju, right? Things like the Buster Blader, Fusion Synchro Lock, or the uh, Dragoon itself. Like, both would better be taken care of via kaijus versus this card, but this card's funny, and it's cheaper, so might as well just try and give it some time in the spotlight. We're going to go ahead and start off with the Raiden. We don't really find anything too great until we hit a copy of Scarlet in the end phase, which is we can use to grab Conquistador. This is going to make our Eldritch package very slow, but we can use our traps to try and get us there. My opponent starts off with a Deer Servant to actually send a Titanoclad instead of trying to clear our board. So we're actually totally okay with this. They're going to normal summon a copy of Ecclesia and Search of Punishment. And then in the end phase, we can go ahead and fire off this Conquistador just to have it on board. My opponent grabs another copy of Ecclesia for next turn. Here we can go ahead and use Radiant again. My opponent actually uses the on-field effect to Destruction Story Memories, which summons a Buster Blader from deck, and I know that thing is Earth. So we just go ahead and fire off the Gozer match in response. My opponent's going to respond with Track Trick into a Punishment to pop a Conquistador, which I am totally okay with. I was not going to use this Conquistador for anything relevant. We definitely, definitely wanted that in the grave as well. My opponent is going to send an Entus and sets a copy of Prologue, but they can't actually use this Prologue because they're under Punishment now. So I'm actually feeling pretty good about this. We go ahead and just uh, mill off the Raiden, and our opponent doesn't actually get to resolve the Destruction Story Memories on field, of course, because again, Buster Blader is an Earth. So, they pop our copy of Gozen, but we don't really mind too much. We can just go ahead and set a Conquistador, and what do you know, we hit a Wakara off the Raiden, and we have a Conquistador in Grave that our opponent graciously put in a graveyard, so we can go ahead and grab not only a Scarlet, but also a copy of White Destiny here. So, I'm feeling pretty good because my opponent can't go into the Escher deck. And they are playing a copy of Magical Hound, which I did have to read. This card apparently bounces back row that is face up from your opponent's field to special summon this card. But I mean, I don't really mind having my Golden Lands back in my hand if I can reuse them. But my opponent actually just, you know, instantly loses connection after uh, summoning an Ecclesia. We did have a lot of good, really good responses, and we were able to really just take care of the Buster Lock because we had Book of Moon. And we had Conquistador set up, so it was not going to be a big bit of a problem at all and I think my opponent just realized that there was not really any good way out of this game for them. So, concluding thoughts on the deck. Even though this is not the best variant of Eldritch, or even the best variant of pure Eldritch, uh, since we can't afford stuff like Pot of Extravagance, this is still a pretty decent opportunity to try and play if you don't have supplementary engines like, you know, Dogmatica cards, or Zoo cards, or Invoked cards. Uh, this runs pretty decently by itself, as you guys saw. Obviously, it can be improved with the addition of things like hand traps or just better cards to play. Um, but overall, the deck ran pretty well. It still is Eldritch. It does what it does best, which is grind out the opponent and try and out resource, which is pretty good. And as long as you play a myriad of cards that have utility both going first and going second, such as the Book of Moon, the Torrential, and the Strike, uh, you have a pretty decent time combating the metagame, even 
not having hand traps. But that is going to be it for this video. Again, thank you guys so much for watching. Hope you guys enjoyed. If you did, be sure to leave a like as well as any thoughts or feedback in the comments. Uh, subscribe for more informative video content. If you want to, you can follow me on all social media platforms or support me via Patreon or TCG Player. All links are in the description as always. And until next time, I will catch you in the next video. See you guys.